Well, good afternoon and welcome back to another live iThemes training event. My name is Nathan Ingram. I'm the host here at iThemes Training, and we are joined today by Joel Kletke. Joel is a sought-after conversion copywriter and consultant. He runs business casual copywriting where he's helped clients like HubSpot turn more visitors into customers. Now, over the years, Joel has audited hundreds of sites for clients, so he knows how to sniff out copy and conversion issues, and more importantly, help you fix them without pulling random levers and just kind of praying that something works, which I think is where a lot of us are. So welcome, Joel, to iThemes Training. Really looking forward to this presentation today. Glad you are with us. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm really excited to dive in. I had a lot of fun giving this talk earlier in the year, and I feel like each time I give it, I get a little bit more excited about it because I just see so many light bulbs come on. So really excited to to talk about this and to be sharing today. Absolutely. And I got to see this one in person last year as well. And uh, as I was sharing in the pre-show, you guys are going to love this. It is fantastic content. Uh, Joel, as we're getting started, let me just ask you briefly to talk about the Conversion Copywriting Workshop that is coming up next Tuesday and Wednesday here on iThemes Training. Tell us about that event and what's going to be covered. Yeah, in a nutshell, it's like a really fast-tracked, accelerated way to go from wondering what to put in when that cursor starts blinking and get to the point that you've got a solid process. You know where to start, what to look for, how to frame things up, how to do customer research. We're going to spend an entire day just talking about how to get all the bits and pieces you need to write persuasive copy. I'm going to be sharing my personal templates, the stuff that I've created and refined over years to make myself more efficient, keep myself organized, to show myself what to look for. And then on the second day, we're going to be diving in hands-on writing actual copies. So we're going to look at all of the different elements of a landing page, how to do them well. There's going to be an opportunity for some of the people in the workshop to kind of share what they're working on, get feedback straight from me. So it's a two-day intensive. And if you're, it doesn't matter where you're starting from, whether you feel like you're brand new to this it's not in your job title never will be you just want to be good at it or whether you feel like you know the basics you know where you're going to be you want more efficient more proven ways to do things you're going to get more out of those two days than you'd get i think out of reading 10 20 30 blog posts scattered around the web it's focused intensive and it's going to be a lot of fun absolutely and you'll have access to joel for questions and answers throughout everything we do here on iThemes training is very interactive and it's it's really a treat for me to be able to bring you folks the best presenters of the field that we're talking about. And uh, you'll have your opportunity to ask Joel questions throughout that event. Uh, there is a special going on through tomorrow at midnight. So it's $50 off for the early bird registration, but you have to take advantage of that by tomorrow because on April the 20th, it goes away. So if you want to uh, join that event, please do so. You can get the information by clicking on that yellow button beside the chat. Now, a few housekeeping details before we get into today's content. If you're just joining us and go to webinar, actually a lot of folks just piled in there, make sure you are in the chat room, which is located at iThemes.com forward slash chat, iThemes.com forward slash chat. If this is your first iThemes training event, first of all, welcome, glad you are here, uh, but just want to let you know that we don't use the questions feature in GoToWebinar. So if you have a question, you need to head over to the chat room and ask it there. iThemes.com forward slash chat, again, is that location. I'm also going to share in the chat room right now the link to today's slides. You can download those as a PDF. Also going to share with you the replay link. So if you want to go back and watch this after we're finished today, or if you want to share it out with someone else, the replay link is there in the chat. It's the same place you went to register for the webinar. It'll have the video there for you to rewatch uh, forever. So it's there. Uh, if you want to go back and check it out later, just give us about an hour or so after we wrap up today to get that posted and converted so you can view it. If you have a question, we encourage that. We love interactivity here on iThemes Training. So ask your question again there in the chat room, iThemes.com forward slash chat. It's helpful for me if you preface your question with the word question in all uppercase. And my job is to save those questions for Joel as we get to a point of Q&A wrap up at the end of the webinar today. Uh, just do me a favor. If you ask a question, watch the chat room for the next minute or so and see if I have a follow-up question for you, just to make sure we have a good, clear question for Joel to answer when we get to that time of Q&A. So I think that's it. Uh, looking forward to this one. A lot of good information today. Let's jump into copywriting mistakes. All right. Sounds good. Well, thank you guys so much for being here. This is going to be a lot of fun. Uh, I have audited, worked on, edited hundreds of sites at this point. 
I do a lot of work in the B2B and the software spaces, but I have looked at everything from not-for-profit to healthcare to fitness. And so when I say that these are 10 conversion killing copywriting mistakes, what I mean is these are the 10 things that I see almost every time I go through. On some site, I'm virtually guaranteed to see one of these. Before I get too far, I hate those slides on presentations that are like long-winded bios where the person really rags on like how important and you know impressive they are. So I've got a two second too long didn't read. I help companies get more leads to do what they want. So I help companies get more people who visit, more people who engage to do the thing that company wants them to do, whether it's sign up, download, buy. And that's really all that we care about right now. Let's not waste a whole bunch of time on that. So if this is you, if when it comes to copy, you really feel like I have no idea what I'm doing. I'm dabbling here. I'm bringing in bits and pieces and systems I've read all over the place. I'm making stuff up as I go. You are far from being alone. And this presentation is for you. I think for most people, they feel like they have kind of a grasp on the basics. Everybody knows how to write for the most part, but writing well and writing with intention and especially writing when you want someone to take action at the end of it can feel really imposing. And you can feel kind of like this guy I have no idea what I'm doing. So today we're gonna to break down some of the mistakes that you may be making. I'm gonna encourage you, open up your own website, open up a client website as we go through and see, hmm, you know, keep a mental tally. Yep, we did that, nope, we're in the clear. And just kind of take score for yourself. How do you stack up here? How much of this stuff are you already thinking about and proactively doing? And even if somehow, it's never happened, but even if somehow you're doing it all, I can virtually guarantee I'll give you some sort of new tip or way of looking at things that's gonna be really helpful for you. So let's dive into the first mistake. And the first mistake is that you wee weed all over your copy. You weed all over your copy. Here's what I mean by that. Your leads are never gonna care as much about you as they do about themselves. They will never want to read copy that's just wee, 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 wee. Now there's times and places for that. There is a time, yes, to talk about yourself, to use we, to talk about the way that you do things. But for the most part, your leads are looking for themselves in the, your copy. They're looking for themselves. So let's take a tangible example. So here is a website, Guided Fly Fishing Trips in Bozeman, Montana. And I've taken the time to highlight in red all of the times they talk about themselves. We are, we are. And then that sad little green bit all by itself at the very end is the only you. So if we quickly read this, we have been guiding fly fishers on the many waters around Bozeman, Montana since early 2000. Our Bozeman fly fishing guides, walking manglers of all skill level, levels on our various wading and float trip options, da 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 da. Uh, providing fun and productive fly fishing experiences in Southwest Montana is really what fins and feathers is all about. We were awarded our commitment. And then at the very end, planning your Bozeman fly fishing trip. But the problem is that they're your lead, they care about themselves. They care about what they want to get out of it, their concerns, their needs. And when you prattle on about yourself, they get bored, they get tired, they're not invested in your copy. So let's imagine that this company had hired me and said, you've got five minutes to rewrite this paragraph and make it less awful. This is what I would do. So look at all the ways that we brought you into the conversation now. So instead of we do this, we do that, we've been awarded this, we've been awarded that, you make the copy about them. Imagine yourself fishing on the pristine waters of Bozeman, Montana with a guide who could take you to all the best spots, the kinds of places most locals keep secret. When you book your fishing trip with Fins and Feathers, you're guaranteed a one-of-a-kind experience. You choose your own adventure. Both waiting float trip options are available. And because we've been awarded, there's the one we. Because sometimes you have to use the word we. It's only natural. We can't say because you know we've been, and even then you'd be using we. So it's not that you should never use it, but notice the strategic usage. So because we've been awarded this award, here's what that award means for you. You can rest easy knowing your adventure will be memorable for all the right reasons. Now I'm exaggerating with my tone and my language, but that's how people tend to read copy. They look for themselves in it. They look, is this right for me? How will this help me? What's in this for me? So we went from this very much you, uh, we, we, we to you. 
Because ultimately, this is really what's happening. Your person who is a customer, you are not the hero of your story. Your product is not the hero of the story. Your customer is. They're the person with the pain. They're the person making the decision. They're the person looking for a solution. So you are the fire flower in Mario. You are the tool that gets them to become that awesome person who, in this case, can do rad stuff as user onboard put out there. So... Let's break this fix down, talk pains, talk gains, and use verbs over nouns. So instead of saying something like, we strive to, talk about what you actually help people do through their lens. So get more leads with, or instead of saying our services include, you can say built for clients who want or ideal for you if you want. Instead of saying we deliver more traffic, you can just promise it again through the lens of what they want. So get outcome without pain. Instead of saying our mission is to, you can say you want so-and-so and that's why our mission is to. Wherever you can, lead with you. Not you as a company, but you the lead. You, you, you instead of we, we, we. There are some exceptions, of course, because sometimes it would be totally unnatural to write that way. So when you're talking about a process, when you're talking about the way that you do things, yes, you want to talk about the value of each step back to the customer or talk about the value back to them, but it's pretty hard to avoid the word we when you're talking about you as the acting company. You can absolutely use we when you're making a promise or a guarantee. We guarantee this or we promise this. That's one of the most powerful ways you can use we because you're taking ownership. You're making yourself accountable. And then in biographies, it'd be pretty weird if you never use the word we, so I think it's probably safe. But in general, if you're looking for a rough rule, there's no absolutes, but go for 80-20. Go for 80% talking about them, 20% talking about yourself. So that's our first mistake. The second mistake, you wrote copy in a vacuum and that sucks. Now that's a terrible pun. I want to apologize to everybody listening. I, you know, I, I'll own that this was my mistake in putting this in there, but it makes a good point, right? You wrote in a vacuum and that sucks because the point is, and anyone who was on the previous webinar we did, this will start sounding familiar, but we're going to go over it again anyways because we want to internalize this. Oh, your can't sell. My goodness, what a mistake for a copywriter to make. You can't sell to a customer you don't understand. Let's pretend that R is not there. You can't sell to a customer you don't understand. You are not your customer. Don't try to think for them. So for what do we need to know about our customers? What, what does it mean to really understand a customer? Because that's kind of a nebulous thing, right? There are primarily four things, four different factors we want to understand about a customer. What are their pain points? So what problem do they have? What current pain are they experiencing? Or what sort of is motivating them to look for a solution? Their anxieties, so what might keep them from purchasing a solution, from taking action? What sort of things are they worried about? The outcomes they desire, so what does their ideal life look like if everything goes to plan? What is it they want for themselves? What does that outcome look like in their perspective? And then their priorities, because not all pains, anxieties, and outcomes are given equal weight. We might all say we want something, but there's usually some things that we want a little bit more or some features that we care about a little bit more or some anxieties that will definitely keep us from buying or others we might move ahead even if they're not assuaged. So the fix is to have structured conversations with your current customers and leads. The way you learn that stuff is by talking to people. You can't do this in isolation. You can't shut up your doors, hover around a board table and just do it with your internal team. You have to talk to people. Because remember, you are not your customer. Stop trying to think for them. So what do we mean by structured conversations? Well, generally, the formula that I use is before, during, after. We want to turn our leads, our customers, into storytellers telling their story. What was going on before you encountered the product? What was it like using the product or during the course of working with that company? What did that during relationship look like? And what is after like? So we've got this visual here, right? Before this guy needs a shave, during is the act of actually shaving, experiencing the product or service, and after, here's the end result. So some questions you can ask, some before questions. When you're trying to discover pain points, you can ask questions like, what sent you looking for a solution like ours? Or if you're trying to discover past failures, the points of comparison for them, what else did you try? What didn't you like about it? If you're looking for anxieties and hesitations, what almost kept you from choosing X product or service. If you're trying to get at their underlying desires, what was it you were hoping to get out of this? When you went looking, what were you hoping to get out of this? What was in this for you? 
some during questions you can draw on are things like their decision criteria. So when evaluating this product or service, what did you find most compelling about it? With their priorities, what made X product or service best for you? With delivery, so with the actual delivery of the product or service, what was your first impression of X product or service? So then after questions, so when we're talking about impact, how has X product or service changed your life, your business, your role, your outcomes, your revenue, whatever it might be that applies to that situation? A question for an underlying driver might be, what can you do now or do better because of X product or solution? And then naming the solution. So if you have problems with people talking about your solution ways, you know, different ways, or uh, if you if you really need someone to kind of give you that soundbite, you might ask them, if a peer asks you why they should use XPark solution, what might you tell them? And the goal there is that we're trying to get them to communicate things kind of in their own words, to tell us a story instead of just giving us their opinion. Because their experience is always going to be more helpful to us with copy than their opinion ever will be. So number three, big mistake number three, is that you assumed your leads knew things they didn't. So again, if you're on the previous webinar, you got a taste of this, but there's one more thing we really, really need to know about our customer, and that is their awareness level, the context that surrounds them as they go looking. How aware are they? And the reason we need to know this is because your lead state of awareness impacts everything about how you write to them, how long your content should be, which ideal headline you should roll with, whether you should start with pain or start with benefits or start by communicating a deal, what your call to action should be, what's appropriate for that level of context. It impacts virtually every single part of your copy because the same lead at different points of awareness will respond or ignore different things respond to ignore. So let's quickly break down the states of awareness. There's five of them. I typically tend to focus on the first four because the fifth one people get really confused about. Everybody thinks that all their leads are completely unaware. I'll explain why that is not the case. So most aware. Someone in the most aware phase of things, this is if you're asking them, okay, well, what do you know right now? They might say, I know your product and I know it will solve my problem and I know how it works. I just don't know the deal. I don't know the incentive. Why should I buy right now? What's the, the impetus for me to take action right here and now? Someone who's product aware might say, I know about your product, but I'm not sure that it's right for me. These people are actively establishing their preferences. They're making comparisons. They know you exist. They know their pain. They understand how your solution might work, but they're trying to figure out, is it the right solution for them? Someone in the solution where stage might say, hey, I know the results that I want. I know what I want to achieve, but I'm not really sure how your product or service is going to deliver. So these people really need to know the how it works. They really need to understand the mechanics of your product or solution and how it's delivered. And then they need to be told, you know, here's why it's right for you. And then they need to be told the deal. And if someone's problem aware, they might say, well, I know I've got a problem, but I'm not sure how to solve it. And all these people understand is their pain. All they know is that they have a problem, but they might not even be aware that solutions exist. And that's completely unaware when people mistakenly assume that people are completely unaware because like, well, the product, they haven't heard of me before. But that's not the case, right? Even a cold email to someone, if you're emailing somebody out of the blue, that person is not by definition completely unaware. Someone who's completely unaware doesn't even know they have a pain. They don't even know they have a problem, which makes them one of the hardest groups to possibly market to. And very little time for most companies is spent on this group. So they know they've got opinions, beliefs, and ideas about who they are and how they see the world, but they know literally nothing else. For these people, there's not even a problem. So just quickly, if you harken back, if you were at the previous session, you remember the example I used with floss sticks. So let's just take a quick look. You have different conversations with people who are at different states of awareness, right? Like if we were at a restaurant and you had something stuck in your teeth uh, and you needed to get it out and you knew you had something stuck in your teeth and you'd heard of floss before and you knew how floss worked. And I hope everybody in the audience knows how floss works. If you don't, please send me an email. I'd be happy to explain. It's going to change your life. But if, you, if that was you, I would say, well, if you have something in your teeth, you need floss. I've got floss right here. It's just 50 cents a pack, so you'll save a buck, right? But if you're only solution aware, I might have to say, listen, if you have something in your teeth, uh, you need to get it out. If you need to get it out, you might consider a toothpick. But if you're considering a toothpick, you should also consider floss. Floss works like a toothpick, only it cleans more thoroughly since it can reach even the tightest crevices. You can get that truly clean feeling around your entire mouth without it going soggy, breaking, or jabbing you in the gums. Plus, it's peppermint flavored, so fresh and clean. I'll have floss. I have floss right here, and it's just 50 cents a pack. So notice, the less aware that person was, 
the more I had to say to get them to the point that they would be ready to purchase. The less they knew, the more I had to explain, the less they were aware of, the more I had to make them aware. And I sincerely hope that at least one person in the chat can attest to the fact that this made them feel like an overwhelming urge to leave their desk or their computer and get some floss and floss their teeth. That's always really gratifying for me. So to sum up, if someone is most aware, just show them the deal. If someone is product aware, reinforce desire, differentiate your solution and prove it. If someone is just solution aware, show them how it works, prove it and give their desire a goal. If someone is problem aware, you wanna agitate that pain, so show them you empathize, build up that empathy and then lay out the what of your solution, so what the solution is. And if someone is completely unaware, all you can really do at that point is speak to their state of mind. And kind of in descending order, it goes from shortest to longest as a general rule, or fewest touch points to highest number of touch points to get somebody in a position that they'll be ready to buy. So how do you learn this through? You can learn this through surveys, you can learn this through chat, you can learn this through keywords, you can learn this through interviews, you can learn this through situational marketing uh, situations. In the workshop, we're gonna dive deep on this stuff. We're gonna talk about how you can use these different tools to identify states of awareness. For now, just know that these are the tools in your toolkit. You can go look at places people are having conversations. You can have those conversations yourself. You can comb through the context that brings them to you. So big mistake number four, huge mistake number four, you let design lead copy right off a cliff. And I guarantee there's people in the chat right now who are doing this at the moment. See, the problem is when you start with web design or you start with product design and you don't consider the copy that's actually supposed to sell that thing, what you're doing is painting all the pretty pictures and then trying to cram the story into pictures it wasn't built for. You're trying to cram the story, cram the sales pitch into a frame that doesn't work for it. It's the fat guy in a little coat of copywriting. You're trying to cram the fat guy in a little coat. You need to let copy lead design. But I can hear people already reflexively saying, well, that just doesn't work in the real world. Clients take forever to get me the copy. Sometimes I need to be inspired by a template to know what I should write. So ideally, you would write and then design. You'd have the copy framed up and then you would design. But realistically, what winds up happening on projects I work on, on projects that you'll probably work on if you're doing this right, is that you iterate in tandem. You start with the copy, and then you go to design and it goes back and forth and the two disciplines work proactively with each other to tell the best possible story. So for example, let's try to make this a little bit real. First, you're gonna define a baseline. So with the new case study buddy.com, this is what we did. So when I write, I write to a rough wire. So you'll, you'll talk between the, between the writer and the designer say, okay, we need these types of sections in this rough order because, and then the other reasons, whether it's the awareness level, whether it's because you need to cover these points, whatever it might be. So you start by defining, okay, in a broad sense, these are the types of sections we're going to need. We're going to need them in this rough order. The actual visuals, aesthetics, that stuff might change, but that gives you enough of an idea that both parties can start working on their piece. The copywriter can start working on their copy for those different types of sections. The designer can start mocking things up a bit. And then you come together and you iterate. And the, the copywriter might send across something the designer will make it look and feel better. Or the designer might do something and the copywriter might say, actually, you've separated ideas that need to be together to be effective. And so it goes back and forth. And so you can see, you know, again, just watch the visuals. You go from a rough wire like this and eventually wind up at a place like this. You write, then you wire, then you evolve on the wires. I never write anymore. I never write to Microsoft Word if I'm working on an email series, a landing page, a website. Because in Microsoft Word, the font sizes are so tiny and you have no true sense. I mean, you can beef up the font sizes. That's a thing you can do, I know, with word processors. But the font sizes are so tiny, the layout is not there that you don't realize how much real estate, attention, time, your copy is actually eating up. But when you write to a wireframe, then you start to see, okay, here's how this would actually play out. Here's how the experience would actually look and feel. And it gives you more of an opportunity to evolve things meaningfully. Now, if you're sitting there and saying, that sounds like a lot of work, know that it is a lot of work, but it does work. This is the exact process. There's a link on the bottom there that both Austin Knight and then myself and Josh Garfalo 
used when we completely overhauled all of HubSpot's core sales pages. It was this iterative process. And by following this process, we doubled their conversion rate, we doubled their inbound call volume, we saw 35% higher demo requests, 27% higher product signups. This is not an advertisement for me. What I'm saying is that when you follow a process where both disciplines have a chance to have a dialogue and contribute, the end result is great. But when you cram a fat guy in a little coat, that coat's gonna rip and things aren't going to go well for you. So big mistake number five, you forgot or you buried the so what? You forgot or you buried the so what? Here's what I mean by that. Your leads need to see an immediate and obvious benefit or engaging pain to dig into. If they don't, there is no so what for them in your copy and they are gone. See, we've been taught by watching like movies and plays and magicians that there should be some sort of grand reveal, that you need to have this gigantic buildup where it's secretive and you're not naming things and all of a sudden, ta-da, here's the big thing. The problem is that your leads need you to spoil the ending so they can give a crap about the rest of it. So let's try to break this down, make it real. If we look at Chime, Meet your new community manager. Skilled, educated, ambitious, and ready to jump into the trenches with their your team. It'll be like they were always there. So what? So what? So what if I'm meeting a community manager? So what if they're skilled, educated, ambitious? What does that mean for me? What's in this for me? What do I get out of it? It's a very clever copy. It's a very descriptive copy, but the benefit's not clear. The so what is obfuscated. And so for a lead, it's like, okay, well, hello, new community manager who's skilled, educated, and ambitious, but what does this actually mean for me? Then here, let's look at another. So here's a great example of explaining the what, but not the why. This is probably the most common problem on every software site I've ever worked on is that their current iteration does a great job saying, here's exactly what we are, and then does absolutely nothing to sell someone on why they're the right solution. So where business connects, which if we took that headline off this page and put it on somewhere else, would you have any clue what this business does? Probably not. But then Gotcard gets, okay, yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll explain. Gotcard is a network relationship management solution that connects your business to the world via your business card. And that's great. But why? Why is that great? Why do I want that? So what? So what that you're a card that does this? What's in it for me? Why do I care that you're a thing that does a thing? That's how your leads are reading this copy. Why do I care? Or if we look at the Skyward, e the Skyward email there. So they start off and say, hi there. And then before giving me a reason to care, they just say it's no longer enough to simply publish content or even publish more frequently than competitors. Being a master at content marketing requires strategic thinking, creative storytelling, yada, yada, yada. There's no so what. There's no hook. There's no in anything interesting until you get to the second paragraph. Over the past year, we surveyed nearly a thousand people on what it means to be a modern marketer. We gathered the data and analyzed what makes the most successful content marketers different than their peers. Talk about burying the lead. Why not start the email by saying, we interviewed a thousand people and separated the most successful content marketers from the rest. And here's what we learned, link to survey, end email, right? Give them a so what? Or for example, here's a positive example of a project that I had the privilege of working on. So Prio makes running efficient board meetings as easy as it gets. So you can eliminate paper, simplify collaboration, and bring everything together in one secure place. If you're wondering if you have a so what or not, see if any part of your hero section on your landing page or website answers the following, so you can, dot, dot, dot. If it's not there, you don't have a so what. Odds are good you don't have a so what. There's, there's no real explanation of the benefit. Or look at Joanna Weave's emails, right? So Joanna opens with, I can fix your emails. So what? I can take care of those for you. And again, and then she dives right into the so what. She gets people interested. Okay, you can fix my emails. That is the so what. And then dives into the rest of the copy to explain. So finish the sentence so you can if you're looking for a quick hack to make sure you've got a so what in your email, in your landing page. Start with the why and spoil the ending. So don't have this big grand reveal that's buried way at the bottom of your page that nobody ever sees and delete your warm-up copy. Odds are really good, the average email, the average website, the average paragraph you write, if you deleted the first few sentences, nobody would know they were missing. Nobody would go, oh, that's too bad. Like nobody would miss that preamble in your email or your report that says, from the dawn of time, 
man has wondered how they could improve their email copy. No, like just delete that and tell them how to improve their email copy. All right, number six, you got things all mixed up and the conversation got weird. So if we were having a conversation on the street and I walked up and you said, hey, I'm Joel, how's it going? And you said, uh, hey, uh, I'm Nathan. And then I said, oh, how, how are things going today? And then you said, that'll be a million dollars. We missed something, right? We, we missed a step there. Something went awry. That's a really weird conversation for us to have in person. But we do that all the time on our websites. We introduce information people aren't ready for, or we omit information that we think they already have, but they don't. Your landing pages, your emails need to follow a logical order of conversation, whether you're starting with the so what, whether you're explaining, have a natural conversation. Don't jump from section to section, introducing ideas at random. The whole thing builds off of each other. Every line should logically follow from the previous, not just shotgunning different elements into a page because you think they belong there. So the fix here is to start with the awareness level of your leads, learn the questions they're actually asking, answer them in a conversational order, keep customer priorities in mind, and if it helps, start at the end. If it helps, start with the end goal and then build your argument in reverse. So let's look at an actual example. This is another project that I worked on. So for Traffic Think Tank, what Traffic Think Tank is, they're a private community for people interested in learning and getting better at SEO. That's the gist of it. They've got some fantastic leadership and so on, but this is not a pitch for them. This is just giving you some context. So learn SEO that actually works from SEO is actually doing the work. We start out with the big so what, because we know people wanna learn the stuff that actually works from the people who are actually doing that work and then we quickly explain okay you can join a private SEO community and get personal advice you can skip the guesswork so we've got this great summary then we know that people reading this page are wondering okay well what's gonna make this any different or better than if I go read a whole bunch of blog posts or if I go you know take a course somewhere else or if I go just ask a peer here in the office so the next section spends some time agitating that pain at and agitating those questions that we know people have so that they go, okay, yeah, I, I follow along. We start explaining what's different, what's valuable about the solution because we know that their initial knee-jerk reaction is gonna be resistance. Like, why would this be any better? Then next we spell out, okay, not just like, here's why this is different, but here's everything included, right? So now that you know why this is different or better, we're gonna really lay on and spell out all of the different things you're gonna get as a member of this group. And then we go even deeper, say, beyond just having private Slack community, live Q&A, 200, 200 plus thousand members only content, you get the inside scoop on topics like these, right? So we start digging a little deeper, but we followed a logical conversation. We didn't start by saying, get the inside scoop on topics like these. We needed to build up to this point. And then we talk about the leadership, the people actually in the group. So again, have a natural conversation. Start with the things people need to know so you can lead them to the stuff that they don't. Problem number seven is that you forgot to be specific and remembered all your cliches. You forgot to use specificity in your copy. Now, I used this example in the previous webinar as well. Nobody wants high quality. They want what high quality means. When you say in specific things, when you draw on cliches, when you pull the most you know, boilerplate copy you can, or it's like, we get to know our customers, which I guarantee a whole bunch of people in the chat probably have that. We take the time to get to know our customers. It's a lovely sounding line, but you and everybody else on the planet is taking the time to get to know customers. What does that actually mean? mean right when you say you have a high quality product what does it actually mean so let's give some examples like would you rather buy a high quality pillow or powerful analytics best customer support or would you rather buy plush comfort and ample neck support to help you sleep through the night <laughs> powerful analytics or go from wondering to acting with sales answers on demand best customer support or will resolve any issue within 24 hours guaranteed the difference between column A and column B is that in column B, we're spelling out what that actually means. We're being specific about what quality means and what the benefits are. You can only do that when you know the benefits and outcomes your leads want. That's why research is so critical. You can't just huddle around a room and make this stuff up. This all comes out of understanding your audience. So let's look at some examples. In specificity is boring. So enterprise email protection from today's advanced attacks. What are today's advanced attacks, right? I don't think I've ever heard someone being like, man, my computer got hit with today's advanced attacks. Like I've never heard anyone say that, but they have said, man, I got a Trojan. Man, I got hit with a virus. 
oh man, we got hit with ransomware, right? What are today's advanced attacks? Spell it out. Don't leave it to your lead to bridge that gap for themselves. We'll manage, this is one of my least favorite lines in all of copy. We'll manage your IT so you can focus on what matters. What matters, right? Your leads are not just these like weird autonomous beings who are just like, I want to focus on what matters. I've never heard anybody say that seriously in a conversation about them. So I just want to spend more time with my kids. I just want to lose weight so that I can bend over and garden without feeling pain in my lower back. I just want to buy that fancy car so that I can get, you know, the, the uh, good feeling of having it, whatever it might be, right? But people have motivations. They, they, they have reasons that stuff matter to them. And when you just say, oh, you can go focus on what matters, you leave it so ambiguous, so nebulous that people wonder what the benefits actually are. Just spell them out. So conduct a specificity sweep with every line of your copy, particularly when it pertains to benefits. Is it specific? Am I leaving it to leads to connect the dots? Am I painting a visual or vivid picture? Am I getting leads to imagine? Can they picture themselves in that scenario? Because it's hard to picture yourself in a scenario where it's like, imagine you just got attacked with today's advanced attacks, or imagine doing what matters. Like, what is that, right? That's so open-ended, versus imagine being hit by ransomware. Or, you know, imagine cruising down the highway with the top down in your Ferrari, right? Paint a picture someone can imagine themselves in. And if you're having trouble with this, ask why two to three times. Okay, so you can do what it matters. Well, well why? Why do I want to do what matters? Well, so that you can do X, Y, Z. Okay, well, why do I want to do those things? Asking why gets you closer to that specificity, to the things that people actually care about. So number eight, your call to action makes people feel feel weird. So you remember that R that I like misplaced earlier in the presentation? I think it like was meant to live here and it's just on vacation, like on a different slide. So that's that's what happened. I typed it correctly. Uh, the R just went on vacation. It's traveling um, clearly uh, that this is, sorry guys, that's embarrassing. All right, you, your call to action makes people feel weird. So for example, ambiguity. When someone clicks on a call to action, they want to have a good idea of what's coming next. If all I see is get started with no other clarifying copy anywhere else on the page, I'm left wondering what's going to happen versus say, sail to Stingray City in the Reef. Book this. There's no question as to what's about to happen if I click on that, right? I'm going to book the thing. Now, I want to quickly pause here, take a look at this screenshot. And in the chat, I've got the chat open. Just tell me which, which button stood out to you first. What's the copy on the button on this page that you noticed very first? So I'll give it like a couple seconds. If someone can just do me the honor of, okay, Ron sees download PDF, download, download. Okay, everybody saw download PDF, right? That's probably the thing we noticed first. Well, here's the problem, right? This right here, book now, this tiny little ghost button, that's the thing these people want you to do. So to get there, you have to get past this big gigantic stop sign of download PDF and ignore this completely ambiguous ultimate thermal safari button, which sounds fantastic. And I want to click it just to see what happens, but I don't, I don't have the foggiest clue to get down there, right? All that stuff got in the way of getting people to actually notice the thing we wanted. So when it comes to calls to action, there can only be one, right? Now, I know the thing people are thinking, but what about the homepage? I can't just have one link to one page. My whole site will break down. We're not talking about homepages, right? There are situations where obviously you can have more than one call to action when you're dealing with a lot of different awareness levels, when you're dealing with a scenario where you're trying to point people to other types of information that they need to have to make a decision, then yes, it wouldn't make any sense to make your entire website have only one button. But when your intent is right then and there on that page or in that email to drive an action, the better you stick to having just one call to action, just one task, just one thing to do, the better off you'll be. And we see this all the time in things like email where it's like, okay, go click this link to access the sale, but also could you share this on social, but also could you sign up for this other thing, but also follow me on Twitter. Throwing four different actions at someone leaves them to decide for themselves which one they're going to take. And if it's not the first one they saw, or even if they saw the important one first, but then went down the tunnel of some other one, you've now lost them. When it comes to calls to action, you want to be able to finish the sentence, I want to. 
You want to be able to finish the sentence, I want to X, through the lens of your lead. So for example, one of the least favorite lines of copy ever is when someone just says, subscribe to our newsletter. And that's everything, right? Does that sound engaging? Does that sound sexy? Does that sound interesting at all? If all you saw on the footer of a website was subscribe to our newsletter. Unless you know who that company is and you're already in love with their content, that's going to do nothing for you. Compare that to, say, Ash Ambridge, right? Learn how to stand out from the sea of sameness and get noticed. For her audience, that's something they want to do. And then get weekly emails, right? I want to get weekly emails. And then by giving that some context, I want to learn how to stand up from the sea of sameness and get noticed. I've given that a goal. I've given desire a goal and aim. I've given that call to action some meaning beyond subscribe to our newsletter, which is incredibly boring. Stick to one primary CTA in emails, landing pages, and ads. These formats in particular, do your best to stick to having just one. Now, this is not a hard and fast rule. There are times where, yes, having multiple calls to action does, in fact, make sense. But if there's a most important action you're driving towards, I'd say your first variant, your first test should be to focus just on that. Try to finish the sentence, I want to, through the lens of your customer, and be specific about what's coming. Don't leave people in that situation where they're wondering what's about to come. All right, we're down to the final two, then we're going to have some time for Q&A where we can really blow the doors off this thing. So number nine, you made your great copy totally unreadable. You made your great copy totally unreadable. Well, how do you do that? Stuff like this. Look at the one on the left. So these are two fishing sites, right? Fishing trips in Costa Rica. Now the SEOs in the room, I, this is what content and copy look like when I was doing SEO in an agency like over eight years ago. We'd mash all this stuff together in one gigantic paragraph with 19,000 links and bolding because Google likes bolding. And here's this wall of text that literally nobody but Googlebot is gonna read and it's so boring and long, Googlebot would get tired. Like this is not written for a human being to consume, right? Compare that to the one on the side. We've got lots of white space. We've got lines all by themselves. We've got orientations. I don't even love that everything's centered here. That makes it a little tricky to read, but at least it's got some breathing room. It's not all claustrophobically smashed together in one really difficult paragraph, right? The next example is there's no hierarchy. So we just slap copy on a page. Like, where would you start reading here? And once you reach this point, would you continue down or would you go to the right? And if you continue down, would you then jump to the top of the page? This is super confusing. We've got this two column layout where nothing is given any different level of importance or hierarchy. It's all the same font size. We've got one header. We've got no clear flow to how this is supposed to be consumed. So there's nowhere for me to scan, nowhere for me to anchor, nowhere for me as a lead to understand, hey, this bit's just a little bit more important than this bit. Or, hey, here's the structure of what you're looking at. Compare that to when you've got a clear hierarchy and a focal point. So, you know, for example, from installation and maintenance analysis and, analysis and reporting, uh, it's all done for you. And then here we've got a process and we can see, okay, I start at one, then I go to two, then I go to three. There's a hierarchy here. And even the crossheads for these different sections are bolded and larger than the spaces below, right? Give your copy hierarchy. If this was all the same font mashed in a paragraph and I just had one, two, three and a big wall of text, the feeling of it would be different and no one would finish that paragraph. The way copy is presented really, really matters. Next example is long sentences. So, I mean, you already know that this email is gonna have a very long agonizing sentence to wade through. There's so much information that makes your head wanna spin with the absurdity of it all. Well, bad news, because here's another really long line you're gonna to have to wade through. Big, long sentences. There's a space and time to have a big, long sentence. Not every sentence needs to be five words or bust. But when especially you lead off with a really long, difficult to follow sentence, Consider that your, your lead's brain is like someone on a treadmill and you just cranked it up to 100 right off the bat, right? They need some time to build up, to find a rhythm, to invest themselves in your copy. And if you hit them with this big monologue off the bat, their brain goes, yep, this is hard. I'm out of here. So let's compare this to short sentences and line breaks. Again, looking at the queen of conversion copy, Joanna Weeb, right? Breaking stuff out line by line. There's this big backlash on LinkedIn, you know, months, maybe over a year ago about broetry and like the whole entire post was like one line space, one line space, one line space. 
and you don't have to do that. But hate it all you want. The reason that those posts did so well is because our brains liked them. They were separated. They're easy to consume. They weren't really hard to get into one sentence from one sentence to another. They made it easy for our brains to process that information. So notice how Joe uses line by line and then uses bullets, right? Use the conventions of language, use the way spacing, white space to make things easier and start with a simple short line instead of comma, 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 comma. What would happen if you did 100 setups a day for 100 days? One concept, short sentence, easy to digest. So use line breaks and don't let wits get crazy. Lead with short sentences. Avoid double columns and competing visuals where you can. Obviously, there's times where double columns make a lot of sense, but typically on a website, especially when you don't have hierarchy for them, it can be confusing. And then think of the left to right reader. Where is someone going to start? Where are they going to end? If everything's centered and it's sprawling all over the place, that might make things a little bit more difficult. And then finally, our last big common conversion mistake. This is far from the last big common conversion mistake, but this one makes the top 10. So you made big fat promises without any proof. And how many sites have we seen this on? You know, like best software, best service, number one, this or that, right? So let's look at an example, right? Unsupported hyperbole, world's best veterinary software at most affordable price. Okay, first of all, was there like a contest for, for world's best veterinary software? Like, where did this come from? Who determined this? Who, who said this was the best? That's the things we start asking. And then how do I know? How do I know you're the best? How do I know you're the most affordable? But there's no proof for it. Nothing, right? It's just we are the most affordable veterinary software. And then there's a pricing plan. And so in the back of my mind, I'm going, I doubt it. And by trying to do something positive and say, we're so affordable, by introducing that unanswered question, the first thing I'm going to want to do on hitting this pricing page is go look at another pricing page to prove you wrong. That's how we're wired. Or here, you know, we've got try our gamified list building plugin for WordPress and WooCommerce. Enjoy a 200% increase in opt-in rates with no reason to believe them. Like, why should I believe you, right? Because I could take this and I could say, enjoy a 11 billion percent increase in opt-in rates, right? Like you could say anything here. There's no justification. There's no support. There's nothing for me to look at and go, okay, that, that's credible. That's trustworthy. So I pared this down a little bit, but again, in the workshop, we would spend more time on this. There's much more ways to use social proof and different types of social proof that you can wield. But two things quickly. You wanna use social proof to support your big, bold claims and to counter real objections. But make sure they're relatable and use social proof as a support, not a crutch. So if you're constantly having to fall back on social proof to even make a single point, uh, you, if you're not you know, developing a, a unique value proposition or learning how to explain your benefits or pitch your value, that's no good either. So quick examples, if we look at Basecamp, Basecamp uses social proof in the hero sections that they'd say, okay, you're safe in the herd, right? They have over 285,000 companies to finish more than 2 million projects. This is an old version. It's much higher now, I'm sure. Um, but they use that near an area of friction. They kind of say, okay, give Basecamp a try. You know, they're replacing a claim of like, we're the best, you know, software on the planet, an in specific claim with a specific one that says, hey, a lot of people think we're pretty good. Or countering objections. So this was a, a page that I worked on for PR that converts, uh, and you can proactively preempt objection so PR that converts is a, an opportunity to basically hire a PR firm to do stuff for you but it's not like a traditional PR firm I'm really pitching it poorly but anyways something that people were worried about was well what makes this any different so we had a bit of social proof that said after striking with multiple times with working PR agencies she joined PR that converts and then we've got her testimonials and talking about her success so we're countering a known objection something we learned by talking to customers will this be effective will this be any different so if you're digging this, if you're going, yep, this is really valuable, I'd like to have some uh, cheat sheets, some templates, I'd like to get some hands-on help with this, I'd like an opportunity to explore how to do research really well, I'd like to have some frameworks and formulas to try with my copy, uh, then sign up for that workshop. It's gonna be a lot of fun, it's gonna be a really focused intensive on taking all the stuff we've talked about, going deeper, explaining more, more examples, more ways to do this, and you can save 50 when you register before April 20th. So that expires at midnight tomorrow. And that's enough out of me. So now I'm happy to take your Q&A. You can read my stuff at those links. You can be my internet pal on Twitter or LinkedIn if you so choose. And thank you guys so much for taking the time to listen. I really appreciate it. And I'm happy to uh, get into some of the cues. Awesome. Joel, man, great stuff. Really, really good information today. 
Uh, Want to just circle back around to that conversion copywriting workshop that is next Tuesday and Wednesday from 1 to 4 p.m. Central each day. Uh, there's a little button you can click to the right of the chat room where I've shared the link in the chat room as well. Learn more about that and uh, sign up if you've not yet done that. A lot of great information. Uh, we've, we've heard just a, a scratching the surface from Joel over the last uh, couple of free webinars that he has uh, given us here on iThemes Training. If you missed his previous webinar, I'm going to drop that link in the chat as well. And uh, that will uh, get you the previous free one about just the intro to conversion copywriting. So Joel, we have a few questions stacked up here and uh, we'll get to those in just a moment. If you have a question to ask, please do so in the chat room at ithemes.com forward slash chat. We have uh, four questions stacked up ready to go. And if you'd like to ask yours before we wrap up today, please do so there again. They're in the chat at ithemes.com forward slash chat. So starting off with a question from Ron. Ron works with artists and... Art buyers, he says, traditionally are buying the artist, right? So how would you apply that we guideline for an artist website? Yeah, I mean, again, it's important. Not every, this, these are not like hard and fast rules, right? You need to know your audience. So if you know, for example, that they're, they're really just buying the story of that person and who they are and how they came to be an, an artist and their approach and their technique and so on, then tell that story. Um, you know, if, if their story is what makes them compelling, that's different to say like fresh books, like nobody really cares about fresh books as backstory. They care about what it can do for them today. And with a visual product like art or where the, the person is the story, the person is the product, then tell that story. I think knowing though, there's still research you can, you can do, you know, it's, for example, like uh, when you tell that story in person or when, when you listen to that person, tell their story. What do they emphasize and what makes people light up and how do you build tension and emotion and how do you communicate to people why their story makes them unique or important? So if you're dealing with artists like, yeah, I would say you don't want to have some awkward paragraph that's like, you know, this artist has been through a tough time and you know that that's because they've done so like that would be really weird. So, I mean, context with everything, right? Nothing in conversion copywriting is like a hard and fast absolute. It's frustrating for people who want it to be, but for your specific use case, just tell that story in the most relatable way um, and tell it in a way such that it, it pulls at the emotional heartstrings. That's ultimately going to be more important um, than following a conventional, you know, sales page or email or that kind of thing. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's a great point about, you know, every, there, there are great guidelines that you shared today, but every, you know, every client is a little different. Every story is a little different. So you kind of have to figure that out, right? Yeah. I mean, this is conversion copywriting. It's not accounting, right? Like if you <laughs> bend the rules in accounting, you go to jail. If you don't bend the rules sometimes in conversion copy, you don't make the sale. So everything I'm, I'm sharing, right? It's intended to get you started. It's intended to help you find a focus. It's intended to help you kind of identify areas that really commonly, for most companies, I would say these are issues. They are mistakes. But we have to keep our brain switched on. We have to look at context. And so Ron rightfully identified like, well, actually, in, in my case, the story of the person is really important. And, and if that's the case, if you're selling a very personal, very emotional type of product, um, you know, then, then that story becomes really important. Same thing with, you know, say life coaches. You want to tell that story, for example, yes, tell your story, tell your pains, your highs and lows, but you're relating it back to how that person, the reason that you've gone for this, what that means for that person at the end of the day, what all your pain and what your story ultimately means is that you can relate to them better or you can understand their pain better, understand where they're coming from better. So um, Ron's got a pr pretty unique use, use case, but uh, it, yeah, it comes down to kind of applying these tools as, as you know, to the situation. Absolutely. Uh, so again, if you have a question, ithemes.com forward slash chat, go ahead and ask it now. Greg would like to know, um, we talked a little bit about getting your customers to investigate their customers. And he'd right. like to know, do you instruct your customers to have these structured conversations with their customers? Or do we as a website developer need to figure this out for our customers? Yeah, a little bit of both. Um, the problem is, you know, especially for things like interviews, uh, your customer is not going to be able to have a really objective interview with their own client. Like saying my praises to my face is a really tough conversation to have. Tell me where I've let you down is a really tough conversation to have. I mean, some companies can. So there are places where coming in as a third party, you're at an advantage um, running those interviews yourself. Um, you know, I do get the clients that I work with to deploy the surveys. So 
Um, if we put together like a web survey, it goes out from their email. I help them write the copy for it. So there are some things that they will do. I'll also advise customers to start putting systems in place. So start asking certain questions of a brand new lead after they sign up to collect that data proactively. But during this research phase, this is not something we can just push on to the client. It is up to us to not only have some of these conversations, inform the questions that should be asked, instruct our clients or help our clients send things out. And these are, again, these are the kind of templates and things that we would get more into in the workshop. But our job is to help arm our clients for success for the future, but we have to dig some of this up now because at the end of the day, it's also our job to interpret the data that comes in and to make it meaningful. And that's difficult to do if you're leaving that process in someone else's hands uh, who may not know what to ask or how to ask it or, or what to look for. And a lot of this stuff, I mean, the interviews is something, interviews and surveys and those types of things are things that you kind of need um, you know, multiple people to do or different parties involved, but something like reviewing chat logs or something like, you know, assessing reviews and testimonials or looking at competitors, these are things we can do ourselves. And as long as we have a framework for it, we can get great insight out of it without putting that on our customer. Great advice. Uh, so a little bit earlier, Katie and Greg both had very similar questions regarding calls to action and emails. Uh, Katie says, uh, should you only put one call to action in emails that she's heard that, or he's heard that they're, they're multiple buttons that go to the same URL or different calls to action for different levels of awareness? And then Greg kind of came in and was asking, uh, would you have two, like buy now or learn more depending on where people were? What do you think about that? Yeah, this is another one of those situations where context matters, right? So when we're talking call to action, I'm not saying just like one way of saying the thing. So, I mean, you can describe like, let's just use a crappy example, like download this. You could say download this, or you could also say like, you know, get the guide and, and those types of things. They're all pointing to the same action. That's not an issue. Where it becomes an issue is if you're offering like very disparate channels to go down. So like share this on social versus buy the thing. Those are two totally different levels of commitment, two totally different intentions, two totally different outcomes. We're trying to push two outcomes in the same email. So, or you know, email or landing page or whatever. Now this is, this is anecdotal. So, I mean, listen with a massive word of caution on this next point. I have heard and myself experienced that the more links you start popping into emails, the more likely they wind up in promotions tabs or spam folders and that kind of thing. Deliverability can suffer if you're really like hammering on the links and popping in them, you know, dozens and then tons and tons of them. But when I say multiple calls to action, again, this is something you have to interpret with context. Like if you're dealing with multiple different people at different stages of awareness and one resource is going to be more helpful for one group than the other, then yes, you can push people in different directions at that point. But on a choke page, when you're dealing with, you know, you've got one big action you want people to do, don't pepper in others that that don't contribute to that ultimate goal. So you can say the same call to action different ways. That's not the point. It's not that every button must read identical, but avoid pushing people in completely disparate directions. Um, and that's situation specific, but typically you want to keep things really focused on one big end goal when you're trying to sell someone or get them to do a thing. Yeah. Great advice. Uh, Luke had a request to hear you say the word buried again. He loves your pronunciation. <laughs> buried. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> I probably Luke. say it. There's some words that for whatever reason, I just say them in a strange way, buried, vague, things like that. It's probably wrong, but at this point, I'm like 31 years old. I'm not about to change. <laughs> so. so, Luke, there you go. That was just for you. Uh, so, great question here from Gerald. Gerald uh, works in the event industry. They have uh, events on their website that a lot of times the copy is dictated and constrained by the partners who are you know that that are actually running the event. Any sure. suggestion for someone in that situation? Well, the only thing you can do is arm the partners for success, right? So um, what do you have in common with your partners? You all want to sell out events. You all want the, the best possible outcome, right? Uh, for for you to do that, you have to get buy-in from them to say, listen, you know, you're not trying to take their job away, but the challenge is going to be, can you give them a template? Can you give them something? Can you go to them and say, listen, we want to take this copy. We want to make these changes because... Not because we want control, but we think it could sell better 
or we think we can move more tickets if we rearrange this or introduce things differently. Now, I realize there are some situations that are hopeless and the copy is just going to be dictated to you and it is what it is. But I generally find that looking for what you have in common, what's your common goal, what common outcome do you want, and then giving them a structure and explaining that structure, not just like, well, here's a template, fill it out. Like when I, I never send, when I work with clients, I never send them like a wireframe or a word doc via email and leave it at that. I always either present it on a call and explain why I've done it the way I've done it, why it is the way it is, or I'll send a video. So in, in, in the absence of being able to meet with them, I'll send a video explaining, okay, here's everything I've done. Here's why I've structured it this way. Here's why I think it will perform better. And that way you change the conversation from being about, well, we don't like this word choice or that sort of thing to disagreements on strategy, disagreements on why. And those are easier to navigate than just personal preferences or wrestling for control. So I can't promise that every situation there's something that can be done, but I would try to, yeah, look at it through the lens of like, we both want to sell a lot of tickets, a lot of events. Can we either proactively make these changes for you? Can we give you a structure we think is going to perform really well? And at the end of the day, if, if they're just no, 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 the last refuge you have is to say, well, we'd like to test it. Can we test it? Can we just see if doing this drives more tickets? And if it doesn't, we'll go back to your way. If it does, hey, everyone's happy. You're selling more and everybody wins. And if a client is not amenable to that, use the dictated copy. What else can you do? Absolutely. It's great advice. All right. I believe that brings us to the end of the questions. Um, Joel, any uh, it's gr really great stuff today. Uh, looking forward to the Conversion Copywriting Workshop next week. Again, that's Tuesday and Wednesday from 1 to 4 p.m. Central next week. Uh, discount for that early bird registration goes away tomorrow at 11.59 p.m. Central Time. So if you've been waiting to the last minute to register for the workshop, this is the last minute. So make sure you get that discount. Uh, that will bring it down to $2.99 for that two-day course. All of the resources. Joel, again, what resources do they get in addition to the training? Uh, you get my research tracking template. You get my interview and survey question sets. You get an awareness level cheat sheet. Uh, you get some formula and framework cheat sheets, more like reference points. Uh, there's a landing page kind of checklist you can go through. Um, so there's a lot of takeaways. There's a lot of stuff that uh, you know I've spent some time refining that I actually use myself to this day on client projects. Uh, so there's a lot of tangibles there that uh, you know will help speed up your process, make you feel more confident and comfortable doing this stuff, and uh, you know make you feel like you're, you're pointed in the right direction and making some progress. So that next time you go to write, it's not just that blinking cursor kind of taunting you. Absolutely, and you know that's such a great value and uh, turbocharge your ability to do conversion copywriting yourself and get some great instruction from an expert. So, Joel, any last thoughts as we're wrapping up today? Um, no, I just want to say thanks, everybody, for listening. This stuff can feel really slippery. It can be tough. I hope that you're leaving with something that feels actionable and practical, something to go and do. And every time, whether it's a webinar, a workshop, a talk, my goal is always to try to leave people feeling better than when they came in, uh, leave people feeling like they have something they can actually go and do. I'm not real big on theory. I'm not real big on guesswork. I like being told how, uh, and if that's you, uh, I hope you got a lot out of this. And if you have signed up for the workshop, thank you so much. And there'll be a lot more of, of that in there. Absolutely. And, uh, yeah, I'll echo what Alan just said in the chat, Joel, never boring listening to you, sir. It's been a lot of fun today. Uh, thanks again for sharing with us and thank you all for being with us as well. Hope it was a good investment of your time and you've picked up some good new strategies to up your copywriting game. Again, my name is Nathan Ingram and from all of us here at iThemes, we hope you have a great rest of the week. And we'll see you next time here on iThemes Training, where we go far together.